Cool. Welcome to the panel. All right. So uh, we have a full panel to start with. I'll explain the format briefly. Uh, this is uh, what we call a park bench panel, which means that it's a rotating panel. We start with four people here. Uh, Anna is the judge, uh, which we'll get to what the role of that is. But essentially, we'll start with a question. The uh, panelists get to answer that. Anyone in the audience is allowed to ask any question, but if anyone states an opinion or asks a question in a way that it sounds like an opinion, uh, and that is what Anna is judge of, if it's, an, if it's a true question or an opinion <laughs> formed as a question. So if you, may, if you inadvertently have an opinion, which we <laughs> hope you will, um, you basically take the seat of one of the people sitting here and they sit down in the yes. audience again. And it's round robin style, so Igor will go out uh, first and then uh, going down the line, replacing people as you have more opinions. But once you get off, you can always come back. Right. So you're not off forever. You can, express your opinion you can totally back. come back. And if you're up there, you're free to express any opinion you want. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so I think we have a first opening question. And so if you, if you guys want to grab the mics that are there, just test them, make sure that they're working. There's no order of, uh, yeah, right? very nice. It's, uh, the order of, uh, so I think the first question that we thought would be relevant to the event is what is the security of a snark or stark and is it enough? Um, okay, so starks uh, based on the security of uh, a collision resistant hash function and if you want it to be non-interactive uh, we need to assume the Fiat Shamir uh, heuristic as well, um, and that's it. Uh, except, except of that, everything is just mathematics. And uh, about snarks, as we all know, there is the trusted setup, and uh, the discrete logarithm problem. That if somebody uses a quantum computer, we know that uh, it is breakable. I would agree with everything like that, but the one problem I have with the way Starks are currently presented is that, uh, well, you said that they were, in the way you've created them right now, in the way you're for scaling, they were 2 to the 80 bits of security, which isn't really enough in a practical setting uh, for applied security. Um, but yeah, that's they're, other than that, that's, that's, they're pretty good. Uh, but the, also, but Peterson hashing also is not post quantum secure either, though. So depending on what you're proving, then well, you know, you can kind of alleviate the quantum security. Oh. Um, you can have a team of academics uh, researching the security of snarks for ten or fifteen years, and they can guarantee you that it is secure under every condition. And and then people use them that are not academics or they haven't spent 10 years or they do something they think is secure and they get people to, to audit it and it's looks secure until somebody finds a bug in it, which inevitably always happens. Um, so I think that the security of snarks and stocks is not a problem of like is the math sound or is uh, the D-log problem hard. It's more like a um, it, how often do humans mess up really badly, and are you one of those when you made one of the stocks or snarks? Um, I, I express my opinion as a podcast listener, so um, not as an like, uh, engineer. Uh, that's what I learned from from the pod, from podcast listening about uh, both uh, algorithms. So I, I like that uh, I like that it's uh, post quantum. Um, Secure um, theoretically, and no one knows yet, right? And um, uh, with with uh, Starks, and also I participated in this workshop and uh, uh, where we reviewed the paper. And it's actually, it's uh, it's it's uh, it's it's possible to understand with uh, some you know basic math skills the, the paper. And um, there is no toxic waste, so that's that's great. Uh, and uh, what I like most that anyone can basically participate in um, in the ceremony right when you when you set up start the the only concerning thing for me is uh, absence of um, open source prover so there is no yet but um, well 
community will create one eventually, right? And uh, it, maybe it will have different um, uh, speed speed parameters uh, um, or like features, but the, the the basic protocol will be open source eventually, right? Um, yeah, of course, the protocol has to be open source because nobody can trust a cryptographic proof system if it's not clear. So it's not only will the verifier is of course going to be open source. We might uh, publish a reference prover, which may be not be as efficient as the prover we will be using, but there must be some uh, reference, um, not for trust assumption, but for the community. Uh, so it is a possibility, and I wanted to say about uh, the security bits, the IT security bits. This is just a parameter, and there is no problem to generate a proof for any security you want, uh, 120, and it will be just a bit bigger, a few more kilobytes, and you'll have uh, better security. All right, so now I think we open up. Yeah, let's open up for questions. Yeah, we open I have up. the first one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So related to this, I'm curious, uh, like I'm relaying this question from uh, someone I talked to outside earlier, like a snark or a stark is a probabilistic argument. So what is the probability that it's wrong? <laughs> like what, what are the probabilities? <laughs> and if you have a protocol like Coda that has recursive snarks, the like what people say is that the security reduces with each recursion. So what, like how much does that re reduce the probability in each recursion? When does it become unsafe? Uh, so it's exactly the security, as we just discussed, 80 bits of security, 120 bits of security. If we have 80 bits of security, the probability uh, of uh, a verifier to accept a proof to a false statement is about uh, 2 in minus 80. Uh, if it's a 120, the probability is 2 in minus 120. And you can tune it uh, to be as uh, low as you want to, um, paying in uh, the size of the proof. But does verification scale when you put it into a practical level of security? Yes. It it won't change much. Uh, the, as I said, if you want to move from 80 bits of security to uh, 120, it will add maybe a few kilobytes to the proof, but um, it, it will be it. It is still uh, something uh, uh, logarithmic in the statement size, and you it will be very fast. What about the verification speeds? Oh. Just one second. I think we might have oh. a question or comment from the audience. So. I, I guess, like, I, you know, I don't need to go up, but um, <laughs> it, it's... I, I think you have to. I, <laughs> That's already... You're, you're up. Uh, okay, okay. <laughs> but, uh, oh, okay. 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 <laughs> cool. I don't think I have to. <laughs> I, okay, okay. So, um, but, but I, don't know who, I don't know who said this, but it's uh, definitely not true. Um, what, what is true is that it's, you know, there's something in the definition uh, of knowledge sound argument or whatever that, that you know, you need to build this extractor. Um, and uh, it, 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 it is true in the security proof that the, it, with each recursion, the extractor gets bigger, bigger and bigger. But this, this doesn't relate to the soundness, of, uh, concretely speaking, of the, of the proof system. All right, I think we can actually open up the floor to new questions. Does anyone else have a question or a comment? Um, yeah, I have a comment about the, the Snark thing. So, um, although I love Snark, uh, right now on Ethereum, um, the security of BN 2256 is about 86 bits. So, how secure it is? And why do we concern ourselves with numbers that are above that when the underlying curve is already not secure? We, we, we provide more security right now in all the circuits we built than the underlying curve is allowing us to profile, to create. So that's an opinion, and sadly it's directed to you, so you don't really get a chance to answer it. But you can answer first. Yeah. Okay, you can answer it if you want to, and then you're going to take his place. Oh, uh, clearly not. No, you are. You are. It's part of the game. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I think it was three. Three to me? Yeah, a little bit. Uh, okay. Um, Okay, so again, 80 bits of security in this case, if the entire network of Ethereum miners uh, uh, want to uh, collude and uh, f do something problematic with the Stark proof, they would do it if uh, the verifier is tuned to 80 bits of security. But again, if this is uh, your uh, threat, just have a very fair with uh, higher security, 120 uh, bits of security, for example. Um, actually, I wasn't address. I think the, the, my point wasn't addressing uh, to Stark. It was more like it's about Snarks. Okay. Right now, everyone so then, says. So then you can come up. It, it's it, it, it's also. I don't know if that's exactly. I mean, just to say something about Pass. about this curve. This is because of this like uh, improved. Sieve algorithm in 2016 or, in 2016 or. Uh, Silver and Bergelaskin, I forget the other person. But I, I, I think it's more like, a, some people say it's like 100 to 110 bits. But anyway. Oh, 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 oh maybe, maybe you know different. <laughs> yeah, so actually I'd be interested to hear maybe if you have more information on this 86 number. Maybe there's new developments I'm not aware. Uh, yeah, but at the time I was at Zcash where we were thinking of switching curve and people are saying, oh, it's just 100 bits of security because of this new number of field sieve algorithms. And it's, at least then, it was very con conjectural. So they're kind of saying under this number theoretic uh, assumptions that we, we don't know, that are very hard, like very complicated and very hard to, to uh, estimate if they're true or not, under the, the most optimistic uh, uh, case about the, the, these number theoretic objects, these ideals and these number fields, we only need to go over a space of size 2 to the 100 to, to compute the discrete log or whatever. Uh, but then, again, they make this very optimistic assumption, or conservative, right, the, in terms of security, that really there's a way in linear time to go over this space of size 2 to the 100. But it's, it's, it's a very complicated uh, space. So just as far as I know, there was... In terms of concrete attacks, it wasn't clear that there was something, maybe it still has 128 bits of security, you know. I think you're up. Um, <laughs> yeah, to just also point out too, like, a, a big point of this is also just the, the capabilities, right? Like, if we can envision that, the idea of an attack now at this point is not, oh, we know it's 100% possible, we have developed an attack that actually breaks the security, it's that at this moment in time, there is now a future in which we can imagine an attack being developed, and therefore, is it ethical or okay for us to build an entire ecosystem on top of this, what may be weak curve? So that's that's like the whole point here. So if it is at some point weak, weaker than two to the 128 or whatever it, say, it says, and now a whole new class of attack is showing, this is potentially a problem, suddenly, you know, we should probably start thinking about where are we gonna move in the future, and should we just do something different, and maybe increase some security parameters somewhere to make sure that even if there is an attack like this, we're absolutely fine. So like in the case of like AES-256, like uh, Grover's <laughs> algorithm, you know, does it, uh, decreases the security by, you know, the square root. So 2 to the 128, uh, AES-128 becomes uh, 64 bits of security, but AES-256 becomes AES-128, which is still a great amount of security, which we can probably not ever envision somebody breaking. So I'm gonna have to cut you off soon because you're you're off, <laughs> and you're up. I I was gonna say uh, even if we come up with uh, like a an attack that uh, says we can do it in two to the power of 64 time, what's the realistic sort of implementation of that? You know, um, uh, two to the power of 64 times what? You know, how many operations? How much disk space? How much RAM? People say, oh, I found an index calculus attack that means in a 2 to the power of 60 I can break this algorithm, but it requires you to cover Mars in hard drives. That's not feasible. So there's not just 2 to the power of whatever as being this sort of uh, security uh, measure. What are the practicalities of that, and like, uh, what would it take to implement this? All right. Any other questions in the audience? 
Oh, I, can I say something sure. about that? Can, I, I missed how this works. This yeah, so I think that was a very good, a good reply. Uh, I think maybe it's, uh, we should just maybe separate to maybe two terminologies, like saying something has 80 bits of security maybe should mean that there's an actual attack running in time 2 to the 80. And maybe for, uh, we should use also the phrase to dis differentiate sometimes the, the conservative security estimate is 80 bits, and then maybe to differentiate between those two cases. Do you guys have anything you want to share? No? That, that makes sense to me. I've also seen people doing some, you, you can maybe define bits of security in terms of uh, your distribution on future worlds uh, where there are attacks, uh, you know, with, of different complexities. So we have a question. Hey, so following the discussion of whether it's ethical uh, to deploy substandard or maybe not future-proof security. What's your view on upgradable security for SNARKs or otherwise? Is it realistic to think that we'll have upgradable security and then maybe we don't have to worry about these things too much? I don't know if that's a question. It's pretty common. Like, it's a pretty much a question. I'd, I'd say it's a question. It's fine. You say question? Okay, it's a question. Keep going. Can I answer it? Is it to me? I, if it was to me, I'm not sure what you mean by upgradable uh, security. Um, you just change, you just do some magic. So you just do some magic and uh, you replace under the hood all of the encryption algorithms or whatever cryptographic primitives you're using and everything becomes as secure as the latest iteration. There's a few suggestions for that. Uh, now that sounds a bit no, like no, an opinion. It's, it's now not, you can come up. No, 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 I think not, you're up now. Not. You're no, up. I don't think you're so. <laughs> no, it's, it's really not. Alad, okay. get over here. Uh, you're up. <laughs> it's just a comment. <laughs> no, it's, it's you. We do it, we're doing it this way. You're next. Uh, oh, wait, oh, wait, oh, you're right. Uh, Sorry. Oh. oh, no. God, I'm so confused today. We're missing a, we're missing a, a person. <laughs> Okay. Oh, well, there's three. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, did you, I think there was a question. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm not sure how to do something like that. Are, are you maybe referring to the update, these updatable snarks that have well, come out? Now that I happen to be up here, I'll tell you exactly which, which one I mean. So there's a Hungarian guy uh, presenting at ETH. CC and I forgot his name and he presented uh, cryptography based on it wasn't lattices it was something algebraic and uh, he claims that you can change the underlying group or whatever it is to upgrade Again? The algebraic group model. Algebraic group model, exactly. And he claims you can change the underlying group without knowing what the, um, you know, just, just as a black box. So you, you don't need to know the plain text. You can upgrade the security without knowing the plain text, so you can kind of upgrade the security on the fly. Um, and it has some, uh, this kind of uh, cryptography has some uh, disadvantages as well, but that's a big advantage. And maybe there's another magic. So now that I know there's one magic like this, maybe there's another magic of upgradable security where you start with something that's not known to be quantum uh, vulnerable, but you discover it is, and then you change to a different underlying thing, and then it's not, for example. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't know anything about that. That sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can we open up the floor to any other questions? Could be about anything we've discussed or actually anything at all. Anyone is free to change the topic to something else as well. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm afraid, sorry, I'm, I'm very sorry this falls foul of the rule that might not be in complete a question, but it's more of an, uh, um, an, an idea I like to express, which is, um, you like, can just come right sorry. here, actually. We have a seat open. Oh, no. um. <laughs> Do you want to give him that? So um, one potential idea for upgradable security um, that uses the same crypto system is, well, you can perform, uh, like the whole point of like a recursive ZK snark construction is you can create cycles of pairing friendly elliptic curves where like the, the group modulus of one curve is equal to the, like, the coordinate modulus of another. But Theoretically, you could, inside a ZK, ZK snark sec, you could do elliptic curve um, scalar multiplication over curves with different prime fields. It just would require an offensively large number of gates. But theoretically, you could do it. So imagine if you had a Pedersen commitment over one elliptic curve, you could create a snark circuit which um, 
uh, opens that commitment to a witness and then um, re-encodes that witness um, on another elliptic curve. Um, and that would be one, I believe, theoretical way of, of providing like an upgrade, um, upgradable security. What do you guys think of that? I think that's a great great idea. Like you, you have like a transition period where everybody upgrades their commitments and proves that it's a commitment to the same uh, plain text or same um, like note in Zcash case. Yeah, yeah, that's a very interesting idea. Cool. Uh, questions in the audience. Oh. <laughs> 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 Do you have an Orthodox bank account? And if so, despite having one, do you think you can represent the subset of humanity known as the unbanked? Okay, I think you can come up for that. There's a little opinion in there. There's an angle. There's an angle. Get up. What is that opinion, though? I think I think my opinion was that I gave Tux the side eye before I answered. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to go first? Do you want to answer it? There, there's a mic there. Can you actually represent the unbanked? I, uh, I don't know about uh, represent. No, I don't have. I don't have an answer. <laughs> Uh, yeah. I don't know if we need to represent. I mean, you, you want to. I think we shouldn't. Okay, here's the opinion if I'm on stage. Um, as engineers and scientists and technologists, we should try, strive to concentrate on engineering and science and not pretend that our work doesn't have moral implications, but rather work, but rather work with um, people that. <laughs> appreciate these moral implications, social scientists and philosophers and community leaders and, you know, and teachers and whatever. And I don't need to be banked or unbanked. I need to know who to ask and who to talk to and be part of a group that, that has the sensitivity for those issues and listen to them. All right. Oh, there's, there's another question here. Is it a question? It is a question. Um, so with, the, with regards to the algebraic group model, it is, it is my understanding that there actually aren't any formal proofs of its security. Like, what, what is the security of the algebraic group model? So both the algebraic and generic group model, uh, what they say is uh, what we're proving is your, your system is secure to uh, against a malicious prover that only does these operations. Uh, in the generic group model, these operations are just the regular group operations, just scalar multiplication and addition. What are they for the algebraic model? Uh, so they're the same. Uh, it's a, this question of adaptivity, like in the this always confuses me. Um, what's the difference between the two? Uh, it's, yeah, it, actually, that, now that I, I have a little stage pressure, I, I can't remember the subtle difference be, between perhaps, the perhaps two. Perhaps too I'll, I'll deep of a question for a panel. <laughs> 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 Nice. Um, maybe for some context, correct me if I'm wrong, but the point is that you assume that there's a certain types of things that the adversary can do, and it doesn't model stuff like, for example, pairing, right? If you, if you can have an isomorphism between two uh, algebraic structures that's non-obvious, it doesn't capture that. But then you can prove stuff. Right? If you assume that there's a very limited instruction set that the adversary can do, you can prove actual security, and that's, that's the claim to fame of this. Right? Is that oh, uh, yeah, so that's true, but, but it's kind of a difference if you give an excuse after you do something or you give a reason in advance. So in the generic group model, you have to say, these are my common reference string elements, these are the operations I'm going to do on them, and whatever I get, I get. In the algebraic group model, you can spit out any element you want, but then you have to show how you can get this element as a linear combination of the, the elements you, you had uh, before. 
All right, are there any other questions in the room? And again, this can actually go in any direction you want. It doesn't have to be about what we've talked about. Um, this might be a silly philosophical question, but um, um, do you think that zero knowledge proofs and all this science, uh, amazing science we're building here, um, is just a product of our, um, you know, huge primate brains, or um, is something that we just stumble upon and discover? So essentially, is zero knowledge uh, proof science discovered or invented? Hmm. Is that, that's kind of an opinion, no, is it? No, okay. It's a question. It's a question. Discovered or invented? I have no idea. Well, I'm going to try and answer anyways, though. Um, <laughs> um, Just yeah. whatever you say, I'll argue the opposite. Okay. <laughs> Proper panel right here. That's Wonderful. what we want. Grab your mic. I, I think um, zero knowledge cryptography is not, um, like, whilst it's derived from pure mathematics, it's not an expression of, like, it's, it's, it's very much an applied science. Um, it's built around. around like assumptions that we think we believe to be correct, and I think it's because of those like rather the, they are just flat out just basic assump like assumptions that we have no full mathematical proofs over, like the discrete logarithm problem. I think because of that, you, it, I, it's fair enough to say that it's invented um, because I don't think it's like it's, it's no it's, there's no um like natural. Um, how do I put this? It's, it's not, not perfect. It's not like the, like the standard model of particle physics, where by observing like by observing reality, you will identify like maybe you won't call them particles, and maybe you won't call them like things like force, forces, but you'll 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 figure out that there are twelve of these like sort of um, indivisible visible things that we call particles, and they're mediated by these four fundamental forces. Whereas you can you can like elliptic curve cryptography and zero knowledge cryptography, um, like it's it's far too. I, in my opinion, like saturated with with like our own um, like um, like desires and assumptions and prejudices to for it to be any, any, like anything anything like pure that that could be considered discoverable. Can you argue against that? I think my okay. Okay, he's got to think. Yeah, the, the comment here is for a standard model of particle physics. Sorry, I'm a Russian nuclear scientist. Um, so the standard model of particle physics is based on completely abstract assumptions, which reduce all the current experiments up to the insane precision to 19 free parameters, with those parameters should be defined empirically from experiments and measurements. So there, well, it's invention in a sense that you can write this model abstractly without observations, but it's also a discovery because you can get uh, these 19 parameters from the experiment. But this is just a remark for standard particle physics because I couldn't That's not nice, say this. It's a nice uh, comment, and I think you can come up here. <laughs> I think I was, oh, yeah. In the meantime, I can say why it was discovered. Okay. <laughs> Zero knowledge proofs were discovered and not invented because there's, there's two options. Either there's some inherent uh, truth to mathematics. Zero knowledge proofs are too amazing and special to exist that they, we would just invent them. Clearly, there's some inherent property of mathematics and we, as we know it. And then the question is, is mathematics invented or discovered? And um, if mathematics was discovered, um, then uh, well, uh, uh, then zero knowledge proofs are kind of like an amazing thing that was discovered together uh, with it. And if mathematics was invented, then it would be too surprising to find that zero knowledge proofs were invented with it. So they have, would have had to be discovered. Uh, <laughs> That's an attempt. It was better in my. It was better in my mind. <laughs> I, I was initially prepared to take a position of similar zealotry. <laughs> uh, and doesn't it really come down to the role of ego in the self? Because... Uh... <laughs> All right. Is there any other questions? I think we might have someone out there. There's a couple of hands. Are we ready to change topics or...? <laughs> sure. Um... Yeah, I, I wanted to ask, just, just to, to note that uh, in uh, the knowledge field, you, you have people coming from mathematics, from, from academics, and talking about generic group models and things like that. And you, you have uh, developers, uh, in, engineers, and they have to work together uh, very closely. So I would 
like to uh, someone to discuss the interaction like do the engineers need to learn more more mathematics uh, more uh, prove uh, skills at proving things uh, do mathematicians need to learn to program how, how do they communicate mm. so uh, yeah, we don't have anyone from Zcash anymore but probably they have the most experience with that uh, how does that work I think uh, that's a really good day question day? Yeah. it's a good question I guess you got lucky in that aspect <laughs> We, uh, uh, the, the, and, and isn't it a little bit, doesn't it have a common thread with my question about uh, the banked and the unbanked? Uh, because it, you know, it goes down to our identities. I don't know, I've recently taken to just calling myself an unlicensed plumber, which is true occasionally. Uh, <laughs> because if I'm in, despite the fact that I write in an integrated development environment all day long, most days. Uh, when I call myself a developer, uh, what have I done to my humanhood but drawn a box that puts the role of mathematician, to use your example, uh, outside that identity? And, uh, and then I, I've lost some sort of perspective. And so um, when something comes to me that seems as though uh, it has been discovered rather than invented, uh, I think that it's important to celebrate that discovery with the curiosity of, uh, you know, a human, of a universal creature, and, um, and not, or at least not exclusively, with the role that I might apply to myself as developer or mathematician or whatever hat I happen to have uh, drawn on my resume most recently. The skills. Look, consider what we're talking about this entire day. Uh, and it's not only zero knowledge proofs, and it's not even only zero knowledge concepts. But even zooming out a layer or two from there, aren't we talking really with incredible focus and clarity on notions that are conceptually so new? I, I mean, certainly within our lifetime, and many of them, many of the things that we're discussing are weeks or months old. So the skills and to the degree to which the skills divide us, I think have to be viewed as something that in the temporal dimension are both incredibly fleeting and always accelerating. So if you feel that you need to um, cross a line in terms of those skills, one of the things you need to do is learn those skills. I know we can't all get PhDs in mathematics from Cambridge, uh, but you know, the, the learning these skills and changing who we are and what we think about them is uh, a, a process that happens with incredible rapidity. And I think that's evidenced by the fact that we're all in the, in the room discussing these things in the first place. This is a really good answer. Can we just clap at that? <laughs> that was amazing. Uh, Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, my answer would be much more trivial. And first, I would like to, like to remind everyone not to invent your own cryptography as a first rule. Uh, other than this, well, everyone knows the wonderful implementations of LibSnark, which was done by people who obviously do science, but they write the code. And for people who want to just try to make something better, uh, faster, or something like this, well, you can start with the code. But really, at some point, you will have to understand. So there is no, no fine line. It just depends when, whether you want to be an engineer who is not unbanked but can understand the needs, or you can be a scientist who can just want to feel how it works with his own hands, like build it from the ground up. Not just a proof system, but well, it's the implementation, it's a leap snark. I want anyone in the audience, you're allowed to put up your hand. I know you might have, we might have an extra answer. So, oh, we actually have somebody with a. Well, I have a question. So after this brilliant philosophical question, let's go back a little bit to math. Um, well, to my understanding, and I, and I may be wrong, uh, zero knowledge proofs like, for example, SNARKs or SOCs are arguments of knowledge and not proofs in the sense that the, the soundness is only computational and not perfect. So is that a mistake to call them uh, proofs rather than arguments? Because we're talking about ZKP, not ZKR, A, for example. I think, I think you're good to come up. It is a question. It's kind of a question, but... Maybe as my parting words, 
Can I answer the previous question as my pouting words? Um, but I don't think, I think he just jumped off. Was it your, were you? Oh. No, no, I'm, I'm your heel. Oh. I think you're still here. Yeah. Oh, oh, you know what? You Doesn't wanted matter. to answer the question. Why Stick around okay. and answer the question. Stick around and answer the question. So, <laughs> just one point, in, and it is that the scientists, the scientific disciplines of today are the engineering, engineering disciplines of 30 years from now. So if you think of coders, you had to be a scientist type to write code in the 70s. And by now, any kid, high school kid, can write code, really. Um, and you had to be a scientist type to write data science, kind of statistical stuff, in the zeros or the 90s. But by now, it's getting more and more democratized. And right now, and you had to be a scientist to write cryptography, public key cryptography in the 90s. But by now, it's kind of more common. And Today, you have to be a scientist to write zero knowledge proofs or whatever. And in 30 years from now, when there's enough support and enough libraries and so on, you could do, you know, in 50 years, high school kids will be writing zero knowledge proofs. So, uh, yeah. Cool. Yeah, so it's actually perfect because uh, I was about to ask this question. Uh, we are creating tooling right now to allow anyone to create zero knowledge system. Uh, it's NARC, uh, CIRCOM, Socrates and everything. And we all know that you need to have some kind of quite advanced cryptographic knowledge to actually make secure system. And how do you see um, this um, knowledge transmitted and, and transferred? How do you see normal developers get into the field? That's a good question. Um, well, I think everyone knows the most trivial answer for this too. This is a, well, that's why this work is open source. I mean, the whole idea of open source is relying on that there is someone still in there who can actually read what you made. And if you made the mistake, it was mistake was spotted, this, and this third party person will fix this mistake, but not use it for their own advantage. So, this part basically leaves the requirement to knowing how to write the heavy cryptography. If you go into practical implementations, you don't need to know how to write pairing functions. Is there are 10 people who definitely knew how to write it and they made it before. And the sense of how you implement the actual circuits, well, that's why there, is, there are different people who do it. They have different angle, view angle, how they do it in Circum, how they do it in Socrates, how they work with the dictionary. That is, again, what the open source software is for and what the Ethereum Foundation also supports, as far as I know. So I think the answer is, let's just keep the spirit for this. And if, if a person, well, and now it will be my more or less personal opinion, because I was working a little bit as a teacher in university. Um, if a person you want to teach is interested. He will learn no matter what you do. He will just do it all by himself. You can give him small hints like 1% push in one direction and that's it. If a person doesn't want, you cannot teach them anything. So this part is, if you can make the material which will push interested parties 1%, that's enough. Questions? Oh, there's one over there. We haven't heard from you. I actually have a question that I oh. want to kick off uh, and might be an opinion. Oh no, what <laughs> happens if you come up? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, in the various scalability solutions that we talked about today, uh, from Starks to roll up to everything else, there's a lot of proposals to basically say we're going to create a snark or a stark that fills up an entire block with one transaction that represents a bunch of other transactions. Is it ethical to fill up every block with one transaction from one application? Opinion. <laughs> so what do we do? Oh wait, do you want to take over my role? Okay. We've never done this. I have, so you have. <laughs> no, 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 you stay. He's the judge. I need someone to run around the mic. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna give around the mic. Well, it looks like <laughs> as one of the people who do this, I would have to answer it. Uh, no, it's not. Uh, the problem is, even while all of us give a number, some huge number, we can aggregate a lot of transactions for a huge price, like one time, one time lump sum price. At the point, for, with some concrete numbers, let's say it's 500 or 1,000 transactions per second, you consume the entire Ethereum capacity of every block, like every block, all the time. 
Well, let's first get to the point where the thousand is needed. There is still no killer application for blockchains, or there is no killer application for scaling solutions. We just we need someone else, not to just make the scenarios of scaling or something like this. We need someone to make this application. So it's not only is there a knowledge which is important; it's just the general creativity. <laughs> Maker, Maker DAO is a killer application for uh, so stable, DAI stablecoin, I think, is the first good killer application. As soon as I can pay for a coffee in the morning with Maker DAO, I will agree. We are dangerously close to devolving into crypto kitties up here. I want to just point that out. <laughs> I, I, so let's see. What do the ethics of including a single transaction only in a block consist of? It seems to me that essentially the question is, Whose, whose interests are excluded from that block and whose interests are included in that block? In the case of roll-up, assuming the proof is fair and accurate, we are reflecting the interests of both people whose Merkle proof is being compressed in that block as well as people who want not to need to store the entire Merkle tree in that block whose interests are being excluded, uh, well, we have everybody else that wanted to get a transaction into that block. So I'm, rather than give an answer, I think I'll just sort of observe that that appears to be the ethical dilemma and someone correct me if I, if, if I have missed a part of it. We have another question over here. Yeah, hey, what is the most interesting application of zero knowledge for you? Well, I, um, I give a lot of like personal opinions today. Uh, I don't. Oh, Kosti is still here. Kosti, please stand up. This is a guy who made the game using zero, zero knowledge in Berlin and presented it on stage as the main prize. So I believe in zero knowledge gaming. Well, even maybe it sounds artificial, but well, please someone just design a game which will be interesting. We seen the crypto kitties. We seen that they, those are interesting. Please, just someone. Uh, do you want to answer? Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> you just needed to stand up so everyone, uh, you know, the person who did kind of the kind of the killer feature for zero knowledge. You make a, something funny. Just zero knowledge is this area so involved. Everyone works in scaling. Like let's solve the global problem. Let's use the maker DAO for unbanked with uh, low transaction fees and all this. Uh, yeah, that's good. <laughs> yes, it's good, but. At some point, you need to just think about people who don't care about it and make the killer application. Or, or you can make a poker with zero knowledge too. With probable shuffles and everything, so yeah, can make more and more ideas. There's another question over here. This will maybe be a short one or a long one. Um, I'd be very interested in hearing what a CK Stark or Stark, Snark or Stark would sound like interpreted on the flute. Still have a question? Uh, yeah, it, it's actually a comment. So, just with, with uh, okay, okay, just, just with respect to, to the conversation about uh, is it ethical or, or whatever, because I thought that was a very interesting question. I and mean, I think the the answer is the same for all uh, you know situations where you have some finite resource. 
like a quote unquote public bulletin board or, or whatever that people like to think about blockchains, that you use a market to determine the allocation of that resource. No, it's not ethical, of course. It goes to the person who has the most money. So, anyway. Oh, right. People who don't have money don't need things. <laughs> I mean, it's also giving an unfair advantage to the people who have the technological might to introduce their mega transactions. Uh, but, so, the, the real question then is, is there anything distinct about this particular ethical dilemma and the way that it introduces market effects and technological effects that is... Uh, is it distinct from anything else that you might ask about the blockchain? Like, you know, like, are, are, if, if, this were the, if this were actually the ethical dilemma, in other words, if it boiled all the way down to, well, if the person with the most money wins or the person with the best technology wins, um, it, do, it, do we have any real authority to distinguish that ethical dilemma from any other question that you can ask about blockchain tech at all? I, I, in, I'm inclined to say that the answer has to be yes, but it, it, if we can't identify how, then perhaps that's a problem. So I have a question. I guess that might be a comment. I don't know. However, so a while ago, I was on a podcast. This was a long time ago, but somebody asked a question of me that really changed my views on a lot of things, and it was, we are doing so much technological innovation and at the same time, we're leaving behind those who don't have the privilege of being, of using our technology. What, what, the, what role does our, does the, do the things that we build actually play in the lives of the unprivileged? Does it play a role at all? I think you're actually replacing him now, right? <laughs> I think I'm out, right? Yeah. Yeah, because we had skipped we're, one. We're oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, well, okay, so this is my parting thing, right? So um, I'll try to play it sort of purely political and not go into the metaphysics of who uh, or what the identity is for, for um, people who don't seem to directly benefit. It seems... The hope is, and this is what we've been talking about since the Bitcoin white paper, that uh, I think here it is. Um, and again, this is the very simple political thing. So, uh, you know, if it is true, and it's a big if, that the authority structures of the geopolitical configuration of today are subject to deprecation by dint of losing their stranglehold on the printing press of the economy. And obviously, as we see blockchain grow, we notice that it's not merely the printing press of the economy, but of a number of different computational and economic and social ideas. Then we hope that absent that stranglehold, the governments of the world will not be able to wage endless war and therefore that the victims of endless war who are, have surprising and coincidental overlap with those who don't have the privilege of this technology, we hope will be in a better position. So as we build, one of the imperatives has to be to end endless war. Give another little clap. Does anyone else have some questions? I do not want to go on stage, but I do have an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I, I love to to dream up products, and uh, I've built a couple of companies, and I spent the entire 2018 getting into blockchain. Like, I took a year off almost to just do that. So I was extremely intrigued and fascinated. And now, uh, it, what would they say when you are the smartest guy in the room, you're in the wrong room? Now today, I am in the wrong room, but because of the opposite, I feel like the dumbest person here in the room, because I don't understand the mathematics behind the proofs themselves. But what I do get out of this is an enormous amount of inspiration and ideas for future products that deliver value to our society. And what we observe uh, in the social media and in politics 
strangely, which goes south, strangely coincides with the technology that you guys are working on and that enables a better future. So I think, yes, it does matter. Um, well, I wanted to continue on a previous question, but else, else this one is great to include. Uh, in general, uh, in in the course of human development, and as it's especially well seen in the United States, there is always a cycle that kind of the new money eats the old money, and this is how the innovation works. There were a lot of, let's say, like entities or families, or however you call it, with a huge amount of resources accumulated historically, but still the innovation allows new people to get on stage and get the influence in principle. If this influence would be zero from the side of the public blockchains, uh, it would be very much unlikely that any government would want to introduce either the restrictions or any regulation on it. Usually the government makes those if it feels threatened, so I say there is already already a good progress in this, but it's, it's far from completeness. I guess I'm not, sure. oh. I'm not sure exactly how it factored into the second thing you said, but I would strongly object to the claim that, quote unquote, you know, that people who made money in the past uh, are sort of pushed out or whatever uh, by people who make money in the future. That's just an empirical not true. I mean, you just... You, you, <laughs> If you think that's true, you know, go meet someone whose last name is Rockefeller and ask them if they, how, 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 no, I'm serious, and ask them, how, you know, how much they had to work in their life. Or uh, that's an extreme example, obviously, but of course this is, tr you know, true in less extreme examples. I'm just, to, I want to second that a lot, um, but the another point too is that you say we're building a better future, but the question ultimately is for who? If you're talking about the first world capitalist society that we all live in, then of course, sure, our lives are going to be practically, you know, changed by the technology we're building now. But for a person in Kenya who doesn't have access to a, a, to some of the technology we have, this is a huge privilege. And are we leaving them behind and not going to bring this to them? And how can we benefit their society and not just, you know, white privileged, you know, Western society? Do, do we have time? We are kind of out of time. I think maybe we can ask the room. Do you guys want to do another five minutes? Or do you want to wrap up? Yeah? Okay. I think we're going to keep going. Five more minutes. There's some very good points here. So just, I, it's not a question either. It's a point uh, based on, I'm going to go along with Alex. Uh, I, I mean, just, just very briefly. Um, about uh, where you write about Rockefeller, the truth is in the U.S., uh, in the last 40 years, the number of the top 10, the top 100 most richest men are people who are self-made men. And it's true that there are some of them who were born rich and say rich. But actually in the, in the US, where market kind of work, um, it's much more pregnant than what we have in Europe, where in Florida, for, in, in Florence, for the last 600 years, it's still the same family. So the question is, it, it is, uh, and, all, and also to go back to the Kenyan example, Technology has, bring, has helped a lot there. Mbesa is the most, one of the most exemplary success in mobile banking, and it's a Kenyan base. It's African. It's like it's based in Kenya, and the tech there is bringing a new opportunity, which is tends to go along with uh, what Alex was saying. But can I can I say something? I I I. I... Uh, so for, first of all, I think that this uh, I believe that there are problems with uh, you know. Inheritance and wealth inequality in Europe. There are also problems problems in America, and 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 I, and I in fact they're worse. And and I think probably this example that you gave, you know, oh there are tech billionaires now. Okay, well, yeah, there's 200 people maybe who who now were able were able to make money. You know how many people live in America? It's like 300 something million. So this is like a form of, uh, this is a kind of mythical you know myth of of lotteryism that. Uh, oh yeah, there's this one in literally one in a million, roughly, chance of uh, of, of making money. But it, it's this is we may be veering a little bit off topic. Okay. And, and anyway, I I just want to say, um, yeah, okay. Uh, I don't know what to say to that. I had an opinion, but uh, bring it back. This, oh, this, I like I like I like this guy's politics. Okay. Should we just question? Yeah. 
Let's final question. Zero knowledge related. It's <laughs> a rule. Do you have one? Okay. What hash function we have to use inside the zero knowledge? I'm sorry for the change, but she asked me a zero knowledge. Complete. Which hash function should we use inside near zero knowledge proofs? <laughs> uh, I think probably everyone knows it's uh, Sean. It's you know Dara and Sean's uh, Dara and Sean, Dara Hopwood and Sean's uh, Peterson hash function. Except not with the windowing optimization that they do, because it's an anti-optimization, actually. Uh, I can tell you offline. <laughs> I would say the Peterson hash functions are probably your most efficient bet right now, unless, unless you're looking for quantum security, in which case, we have yet to see a really cool lattice-based zero-knowledge proof that just sweeps the floor of performance that we've never seen yet. And, but of course, it would be, there's some downsides to it. But in that case, maybe something lattice based, based off of learning with errors, would be really, really cool. Um, I will mix quantum oh, security. Turn it on. I will mix a quantum security and concrete implementations. Peterson Head is not quantum secure, no matter whether it's inside of a snark or a stark, or whether it's external function, external proof system is quantum secure. Uh, so I would say, make something which was more or less analyzed and has the least number of constraints. I really like hash function by Dmitry Havratovich from which was presented at the DEFCON. And if someone can do the proper analysis, or maybe just break it so I don't think that it should be usable in the future, please do this. <laughs> what was it? Uh, it was a hash function which I don't think it has a name, a proper name. Uh, it was presented by Dmitry Havertovich in a DEFCON 4 in the last year. She basically has like something like 68 brain chemical constraint system constraints per round, and like per full hash functions should tend to less than 500. So I just, I want to briefly also answer that. It, it depends if you just, what you need from the hash function. If you just need what's called collision resistance, then definitely Pedersen. If you need something that looks random looking, like you're kind of a random oracle, then you still need to use the heavier SHA-256 or, or Blake-2. <laughs> <laughs> but Blake-2 is 20% better, so use that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so what? Peterson or Blake-2, that's the final answer. <laughs> <laughs> or the new experimental one, if you can prove it safe. Okay, a well, question. Break it first, break it so we don't think about it. Can I, can I ask a question of the audience? ETH 2.0, when the fuck <laughs> can we switch to SHA-3 instead of catch Act 256? Thank you. I actually know the answer to that. So they plan on switching to something slower, but they stuck with catch Act because they don't want to depend on this, like, different properties of uh, Blake 2. The, the, the original design was Blake 2, they shifted back, they want to shift to something quantum secure in the future. Very That's good. Reasoning. So I think that we have gone way over time, but we've had a wonderful session with everybody. Um, I want to say thank you to all of the panelists and thank you guys for playing this kind of awesome game with us just now. We try to do this every time. I hope you enjoyed it and got something out of it. Thanks everyone.